Thank you for coming to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan, and I'm very happy to see a full room of uh, very excited journalists and others to, to see this event because uh, we do feel it's important. Uh, one of the biggest global issues right now is the situation in Ukraine, and even though uh, we here in Japan are geographically very far away from the center of what's happening, nevertheless, uh, the, the impact and the, the shock waves are, are reaching even our shores. So uh, I'm glad to see you. My name is Michael Penn. Uh, I am the secretary of the board of directors on this club, and I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, we have three speakers and only an hour and a half to discuss a very complex issue, so I want to move quickly to introduce them and to get on to the event. Uh, sitting here next to me is Dr. James Brown. Uh, he is uh, based at Temple University, and uh, he will actually be our third speaker, and he will be discussing in particular uh, the implications for Japan uh, of a lot of these, uh, of what's happening. Uh, in the center seat is uh, the ambassador of Ukraine to Japan, Dr. Ihor Karchenko, and uh, he will be our lead speaker, and he'll give his thoughts about what's happening, uh, since we are so far away, and we want his perspective on what the situation in Ukraine is all about fundamentally. And following upon uh, his presentation will be a presentation by a Japanese academic on a similar subject, to what is her evaluation, and this is Dr. Yoko Hirose, uh, of uh, Keio University. And uh, at the far end of the table, last but never least, is uh, our valiant uh, interpreter, uh, Ms. Takamatsu, who without her help, so many of our events would be much more impoverished. Uh, so let's move on to the ambassador first. Each speaker has about 10 minutes, and then we'll move into the Q&A, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of good questions. So, Mr. Ambassador, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be once again Mike here. The, is it working? Yeah, Can you hear me? Closer, yeah, thank okay. You. Thank you. Some time has passed since our last meeting in March, I think it was, here in the uh, Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan, and the uh, situation in Ukraine and around Ukraine has developed. Uh, I'll try to cut my introductory remarks short, even shorter than 10 minutes, just to summarize what we think is the most important development since March. Uh, first and the most important, I think, development is holding successfully some couple of weeks ago uh, presidential elections in Ukraine. On the 25th of May, Ukraine voted at uh, snap presidential elections. And for the first time since 1991, uh, Ukraine faced, was faced with the fact that uh, we needed only one round for the election. In the first round, the new president had been elected by a majority vote. And some few days ago, he was sworn into office. Uh, a big international uh, guest party arrived in Kiev for that day, including from here, from Tokyo. Parliamentary vice, vice uh, foreign minister attended. And uh, uh, we heard a very strong speech from the new president. And uh, after that, his initial priorities in, uh, in his position as the new president of Ukraine were named, which include bringing peace to the eastern part of Ukraine. For these ends, he mentioned that he views the situation as finding 
the representatives of the eastern regions with whom negotiations could be held. Separatists and terrorists who are fighting against Ukrainian forces in the East should lay down arms. Third, humanitarian corridors for those who wish to leave the Eastern regions where the war actually is waged should be established, and he gave the special order. And also the humanitarian corridor for Russian mercenaries and Russian citizens who wish to withdraw to Russian Federation who are waging war in Ukraine. This is briefly the plan. The idea was supported by, I understand, and we understand, practically all major international actors who are involved in finding the political solution to, to the Ukrainian uh, situation, including, as we understand, from brief reports on the meeting between President-elect Poroshenko and his Russian counterpart in France, which happened at the beginning of June at the celebrations of the 70th anniversary of the D-Day in Europe. So that is briefly summing up the political situation today in Ukraine and around Ukraine. Two rounds of uh, political talks involving the representative of the OSCE in Kiev had been held to the ends of finding ways of implementing President Poroshenko's view on the situation in eastern Ukraine and de-escalating the crisis. Uh, Russia has returned its ambassador to Moscow, and Russia's ambassador is participating in these talks. So far, These two rounds of talks had brought some lowering of the intensity of hostilities in the East, but had not stopped them. The situation is still complex. Terrorists are still uh, waging war. And uh, Ukrainian forces are blocking the main hotspots of uh, terrorists in the East of Ukraine. So the situation is still hectic. In the meantime, we didn't notice any positive movements from Russian side to the ends of what Russian president had publicly declared, that Russia should keep a closer eye on the situation of Ukrainian border, which came shortly after the meeting of the two presidents in Normandy. What we hear is that Russia is still allowing terrorists uh, and mercenaries to enter Ukrainian territory, and in some cases, Russian border guards are helping them, which once again shows that not necessarily what Russia speaks, including from the highest offices, corresponds to what it does on the ground. But that is the situation we are facing now. I think I will stop here because uh, it's, it's a very brief summary of what I think is the most important development in Ukraine as, as of last several weeks. And the topic of Russia-Japan relations, I think, would be better suited to, 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 to address to our esteemed experts on the right and on the left, because what I only may say is that situation in and around Ukraine definitely is not only about Ukraine. Uh, I would say uh, that it is a crisis in global terms, security crisis. And repercussions of that crisis are being felt all around the world, including here, and we are meeting here also because we have these repercussions. Uh, and uh, let's hope that the world, united world, civilized world, is wise enough to find the way out. Because the situation with global security, because of Russian aggression against Ukraine, is critical. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. We will now move on to our second speaker, who is going to 
give us also an analysis of the situation, but this time from the point of view of uh, an academic. Uh, she is Dr. Yoko Hirose. And uh, Dr. Hirose, please, on um, Thank you so much. Um, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is great pleasure for me to be here. Um, uh, ten minutes is not enough to uh, say about this situation in Ukraine, uh, but I try to um, make clear the point to understand the uh, present situation. First of all, I'd like to make clear the premise of the crisis in Ukraine. Firstly, the international structure after the grasp of USSR have never good for many actors. The atmosphere like Cold War was, have, have been, has been or remained, such as uh, NATO expanding. Then mutual distrust between Western countries and Russia became magnified, and Russian victim consciousness by the betrayed by the Western powers, especially the US, has been also grown at the same time. In addition, Russia must the most uh, most important for foreign policy as a securing Russia's sphere of interest, and in, uh, in other words, near abroad or region of home USSR. And it has been trying to keep the area using four cards, politics, economy, energy, and unrecognized states. However, Russia has been thinking that Russia's sphere of interest was always threatened by the Western uh, countries. Please see the uh, slide uh, number three. Um, it, um, it, it is showing main cases that uh, stimulated the tension between Russia and West. There are many incidents for Russia not to be refrained, and I think the incident in uh, 2008 were most critical. And then I'd like to ma make clear the some point to understand uh, the crisis of, in Ukraine. Firstly, the crisis of development through uh, three stages, that is Euromaidan, annexation of Crimea by Russia, and Eastern uh, arrest. And secondly, the crisis can be understood by the Russian policy for the former USSR states so far, especially russia georgian war in 2008. Thirdly, Russia did not want to uh, cause the Ukraine crisis, especially at that time, because they had Sochi Winter Olympic and Paralympic. Russia seemed to have some scenarios on Ukraine. However, early downfall of Yanukovych and declaration of Eastern Ukraine were unexpected, I think. However, firstly, the U.S. criticized Russia from the first stage of the crisis. On the other hand, uh, Russia thought the first stage was led by Western countries. And then, uh, Russia's victim mentality had stimulated again. Fifthly, the international situation had good for Russia because the U.S. power became weaker and the Western Europe, especially Germany, France, and U.K., wants to keep the good relationship with Russia. Sixthly, the former USSR states um, have been uh, forced to decide pro Western or pro Russia. That's why now some uh, EU officials thought that they rate the confusion uh, in Ukraine by making an either or a situation for Ukraine. Lastly, the information war by the all concerned players have been serious. It uh, distorts the correct understanding of the situation, and it helps to harm the atmosphere again, result in the vicious circle. And then I'd like to uh, indicate some important points of each stage. The first stage that was started from the Euromaidan to Euromaidan Re Revolution and Yanukovych's downfall for the, from the last November uh, to the uh, last of February. The Euromaidan was started mainly by people's uh, dissatisfaction for the uh, corrupted uh, government and Yanukovych's re rejection of EU deal was not the main reason, but was just a catalyst. Um, in this stage, uh, Russia might not participate to the uh, crisis and seems to just 
try to make Olympic Games success successful. However, the Western side uh, criticized Russia as an agitator, and Yanukovych's downfall was felt for the Russia as a defeat. And just this feeling motivated Russia to recover Crimea. Then, then the uh, second stage of the crisis was annexation of Crimea by Russia. Uh, Crimea or, where uh, Nikita Khrushchev transferred uh, from Russia to Ukraine and has been holding that uh, Black Sea fleet has been a special place for Russia historically, militarily, and ethnically. However, it is said that uh, Russia does not think about annexation systemically because, for example, Russia and Ukraine agreed on the maritime border uh, delimination and the carriage strait in 2012. Uh, therefore, uh, it seems to be Russian revenge for the Western powers concerning your Maidan revolution mainly and the Russian warring strategy for the near abroad and Russian people. Russia said, Russia said the special forces to Crimea on uh, 27th February when Ukraine interim government was organized. Then uh, Russia annexed Crimea uh, using undemocratic uh, referendum, which decided Crimean annexation to Russia on uh, 18th March. Russia recognized the uh, Republic, uh, so-called Republic, Republic of Crimea before annexation. It was criticized as a violation of international law. However, Russia insists that it was really same to the Kosovo president. The uh, D7 member applies the sanction for Russia. However, they were uh, so limited the stage, and some EU high officials showed their uh, acceptance toward Russian action. The third stage is uh, Estan arrest. Um, the Prussian people in Donetsk and Lugansk started the movement for the independence from Ukraine and in cooperation with Russia around the mid-match. The interim government launched anti-terrorist operation on uh, 15th April. However, it was a great fault for the interim government to call them terrorists. And then uh, the Prussian people became more radical and the situation became worse. Although a joint Geneva statement on Ukraine from uh, 17th April by Ukraine, Russia, the US, and EU, it did not work, unfortunately. Then the US countries uh, criticized Russia and stepped up the sanction for Russia on uh, tw uh, 28th April. The pro-Russian people in Donetsk and Lugansk uh, carried out the referendum on 11th May and uh, declared the independence and the uh, People's Republic. Uh, subsequently, Donetsk and Lugansk signed a document for the integration of both People's Republic and um, declared the foundation of Novorossiya. Novorossiya means New Russia, and Vladimir Putin also mentioned about the uh, Novorossiya and the TV interview on uh, 70th April. Also, not only Ukraine, but also Russia agreed to stabilize the Eastern region. The situation is still critical. Um, as I told, the situation of Ukraine seems to be very complicated and it seems to be very difficult to stabilize for Ukraine. The future Ukraine stability will depend on the new president Petr Poroshenko's political uh, capability. There are some favorite uh, indications. Uh, for example, uh, Russia recognized the presidential, uh, presidential election as legal. Uh, Putin got them moderate. Uh, Poroshenko and Putin have already had uh, short talks. Uh, Putin talked with leaders EU and US uh, last weekend and uh, Russian attitude for the gas problem became softened. However, I, I worry about that new government uh, continues hard attacks to the eastern uh, Ukraine, including, including bombings. I think Russia does not want to annex eastern Ukraine. However, the worst scenario is that Novorossiya would be unrecognized states like Abkhazia and South Ossetia and so on. I'm sure that our, our actors, so Ukraine, Russia, EU, and EU, uh, um, US are responsible for the Ukraine crisis, so they should stop uh, meaningless propaganda and uh, make the compromise 
uh, recognizing the own faults, then cooperate for the stabilizing Ukraine. Lastly, uh, Japan is facing the difficulty uh, between the uh, US and uh, Russia. However, Japan should carry out the independent diplomacy and continue to talk with Russia, keeping good relationship with the uh, US and contributing Ukraine uh, peace and stability. Thank you so much for your kind listening. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hirose. At the very end of her presentation there, she recommended that Japan should keep an independent uh, diplomacy uh, towards the situation. Uh, now we have our uh, speaker who will discuss in more depth uh, what is the Japanese approach to this issue. And uh, this is Dr. James Brown of Temple University, and take it over. Okay, so I'm going to be giving an overview, really, of my own assessment of how the Ukraine crisis has affected and will affect Japan's relations with Russia. Now, to begin with, the kind of context of all of this, as I'm sure you're, you're aware, that between 2009 and 2011, relations were really bad, described by some in the academic literature as a state of semi-crisis. We then have between 2011, particularly from 2012, a significant improvement in relations. You'll all know about this, I'm sure. Putin's speech in March 2012, using his kind of famous judo terms, hikiwake, hajime, Abe's visit, the two plus two, and the opening of uh, negotiations over a peace treaty. Okay, but how has that been affected by the Ukraine crisis? You can make the case that all of that effort, all of that hard work has essentially come to nothing. That due to the Ukraine crisis, Japan has introduced sanctions, the rhetoric has changed. And there is some support for that view. You can point to statements such as that of Prime Minister Abe, saying with reference to Crimea, that Japan never accepts any attempt to change the status quo with force, although clearly in saying that he has one eye fixed on China. You also have the postponement of the foreign minister's planned visit to Moscow, which was supposed to take place at the end of April. We then have the sanctions themselves, the suspension of talk on further raising of visa uh, requirements, and postponing planned discussions of further improvement in relations. The second lot then is these uh, kind of visa bans on 23 individuals. From the Russian side, you can also point to the statement by Putin at, in St. Petersburg at the economic forum there, saying that we were surprised to hear that Japan had joined the sanctions, basically saying that the Russian side was keen on continuing with uh, talks, but perhaps the, the Japanese side wasn't. So the question is therefore, has this improvement, this rapprochement come to an end? Well, in order to answer that, we have to understand what were the causes of the improvement in the first place? What had driven this rapprochement from 2011, 2012? So to run through a few of the factors there, some of them are political. That things really got going in 2012 with both Abe and Putin in top office. And people point to the fact that they're both strong national leaders, that for a long time the uncertainty as to how long the Japanese prime minister was going to be in office was in general uh, a problem for Japanese foreign policy. It was very difficult for a prime minister to carry through a uh, foreign policy agenda in a short period of time. People are confident that Abe is going to be in office for a longer period of time, and that means that foreign leaders are willing to invest the time and effort to build strong relations. Other academics have also kind of drawn parallels with Richard Nixon, that strong nationalist conservative leaders often make it, uh, often have an easier job in building connections with countries with which they have poor relations. So clearly, Nixon with China, people have said that perhaps Putin and Abe can play a similar role in building relations between Russia and Japan. More personally, the two seem to get on quite well. 
that in particular, Abe has made some sort of admiring statements about Putin. Before his April 2013 visit, he gave an interview with Rasiskaya Gazeta, in which he said, and you can see the quotation there, President Putin has a clear goal, to build a strong, flourishing Russia. My current goal is to build a strong Japan. In this way, the president and I share common values and ideals. I feel considerable affinity with him. And if you look at the sort of body language between the two of them, I don't just mean the photo there, but more generally, it seems to be pretty good. That certainly better than Putin and Obama, and even better than Putin and Xi Jinping, where it seems to be really quite sort of formal, kind of quite wooden. On top of that, although the, the picture seems to have jumped so you can't really see it, there's the economic factors. On the Japanese side, of course, increased demand for energy imports, and over Japan's history, its demand for energy has often influenced its foreign policy. On the Russian side, desire for a modernization partnership of increased investment, particularly in Russia's, in Siberia and the Russian Far East. And the last factor driving the two together is security. In particular, on the Japanese side, wishing to build closer relations with other partners in the region, primarily Philippines, Vietnam, Australia, but also exploring the possibility of closer security relations with Russia. And that's where the kind of two plus two comes from. The Russian side is more complex. Russia's priority in the region is relations with China. It has a strategic partnership with China. However, it too is somewhat nervous about China's rise and is at least considering what other options are available. So to a certain extent, Russia is interested in building security relations with Japan. So in actual fact, if you look closely at Russian-Japanese relations following on from the Ukraine crisis, you can see signs of resilience. That yes, these sanctions have been introduced, but they're really very weak. And I believe that you can see signs that Japan is really signal, signaling to Russia that it's not fully committed to these sanctions, not really committed to isolating Russia. Instead, it's signaling that it feels obliged to go along with the position of other G7 countries, but that it wants to keep a sort of balanced position. So sort of evidence of that signaling then that at the time when Russia was suspended from the G8, you have uh, Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga saying that this suspension is temporary, that Japan, uh, Russia would be welcome to rejoin the G8 after this crisis has calmed down. Foreign Minister Kishida also, when cancelling that April visit, was very eager to say that it wasn't Japan that was cancelling it, rather it was mutual agreement and um, uh, with hopes to carry out, uh, carry out that visit sometime soon. Also saying, we would like to continue political dialogue with Russia. Perhaps most interestingly of all is the two visits by Shotaro uh, Yaichi, the head of the National Security Council, visiting both in March and also in May. Now, I don't know what was discussed when he was in Moscow, but you could make the case that perhaps one of the tasks with which he was charged was in order to convey to the Russian side that Japan was still committed to building political relations despite uh, the introduction of sanctions. We also have the fact that Putin's visit is apparently still on. That Abe said on May 26th that I agreed with the president that we should carry it out in the autumn. And finally, just earlier this month, you have the visit of Sergei Narishkin to Japan. Uh, Narishkin, the speaker of the, the Russian Duma, and also on the sanctions list for the United States. And here you can really see that Japan was trying to keep a balanced position. That it was arranged that Japanese government officials would not meet with Narishkin, but nonetheless, he came. And there were several, event, several events, including meeting with former Prime Minister Mori, who has been used in the past by the Abe administration as a sort of unofficial envoy to Russia. 
And Russia seems to have acknowledged that Japan is not fully behind this sanctions effort. You have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesman saying, this awkward step, meaning the sanctions, was clearly taken under external pressure. Narishkin also suggesting that this was almost blackmail from the American side, forcing this reaction from Japan. Okay, so my sort of conclusions, my predictions then, what is going to happen with Japan-Russia relations? Well, those factors I mentioned, all of them haven't really changed. They are long-term factors, they're still there. And so my prediction is that Japan in the short term, during the Ukrainian crisis, will continue to maintain a position of what can be described as adequate distance. Backing up its primary ally, the United States, signing up to the measures taken by the G7, but at the same time communicating its reluctance. And longer term, I would expect a continuation of the positive trend in relations. However, despite being rather optimistic in that sense, there is a limit to it. I don't see that when talks kind of resume, that we're going to get real progress on the territorial dispute. And that also links in with the Ukraine crisis. With Crimea, Russia has built up the idea, the, the narrative, of protecting Russian speakers. In that context, it seems difficult to believe that Russia would anytime soon transfer particularly the two larger of the Northern Territories to Japan, given the kind of Russian speaking populations who live there. Anyway, that's simply my analysis of the situation and um, I'll turn it over now to, to questions. Okay, well, we got a three uh, diverse views, and uh, now we will, as he says, move it on to Q&A. Uh, now, at the time of the Q&A, when I call on you, uh, the microphone will be over there, and uh, please uh, identify your name and affiliation, and then uh, ask one question. I have a question. Yeah, whoa, we have a question already from the table. All right, well, uh, I'll give the first question to uh, the ambassador. Thank you. Short one to our second presenter, Dr. Hirose. Following closely, I was uh, interested to clear the statement, which is in bold in the last page. All actors. Ukraine, Russia, EU, and the US are responsible for the Ukrainian crisis. I would rather strongly disagree with that statement. And if you can point one thing for which Ukraine should be blamed as being responsible for the crisis, that could be only one, I think. <coughs> Ukraine really ousted former president. Ukraine really was standing for weeks and months in the center of Kiev to show that it wants to be free from corruption and wants to be a dignified nation. Yes, we are responsible for ousting our former president. Yes, we are responsible for electing him in the first place. Ukrainians made a mistake, huge mistake at that time. They learned that mistake sooner than the presidential term of Mr. Yanukovych. And everything else which happened after, which is called Ukrainian crisis, tell me what is Ukraine should be blamed for? Um, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I agree with you uh, because um, I'd like to say about uh, uh, Ukraine fault is that uh, that uh, Yanukovych was uh, president. So now uh, you, you have never uh, been uh, blamed uh, by others. It was a former uh, incident. But I mean, it, it, it looks that mm. all actors are responsible for Ukrainian crisis. If Ukrainian um, crisis, what, what we call the revolution, mm? That's one thing. Of course, it's a national thing. 
But aggression by Russia, how can Ukraine be responsible for that? Public and international response to that, how Ukraine can be responsible for that? Ukraine can only be responsible for fighting back the aggression. We didn't fight in Crimea. We are fighting now. Yes, we are responsible for that because we know what we are fighting. Yes. Thank you. Now I'll open up to the floor. Uh, Siegfried has had a hand going up like this for quite some time, so now you've got the mic. <clears throat> Siegfried Knittel, freelancer from Germany. <clears throat> Ukraine wants to have the uh, Crimea uh, Peninsula back to Ukraine. Now, the, the, in, the, in the past, uh, uh, Crimea was a base of the Russian Marine. So, what does it mean for the future? I think uh, in a, this Ukrainian state perhaps cannot accept, uh, or will not accept uh, Russian Marine in, in uh, Sevastopol. But for Russia, I think it's very important to have a base in in uh, uh, in the Black in the Black Sea. So, what? Uh, how? What, what, what will happen in this case? I have a, a, a second uh, point. Um, I would like to ask you about the relation between China and Ukraine. I think uh, I, what I heard is they have a close, uh, a made a kind of a partnership uh, uh, treatment. And uh, I think in the past, uh, uh, Ukraine was a large exporter of weaponry to, uh, to China, even I think the aircraft carrier is from, from Ukraine. So what, what about the relation between China and Ukraine? Uh, this is a question for the ambassador? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, the ambassador, Ms. Dr. Hirose. Okay. Shall I respond? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the question on Crimea first. Uh, what will happen with the Russian naval base in Crimea? It's a good question, but I think it's a question for the future. And I think you have the point. President Poroshenko made it bluntly clear in his inaugural speech that Crimea was, is, and will be Ukrainian. He also referred to the fact that in the very same terms he delivered that opinion to his Russian counterpart in Normandy. So there is no question about that. I mean, legally, it's all clear. Question when and how the return of the stolen thing would be negotiated. That's the matter for negotiations. And then I think we'll come by the issue of Russian naval base in Crimea, which I think in these circumstances is highly debatable whether we will have a public opinion in favor in Ukraine. But that comes later, after we first restore law and order in the eastern part of Ukraine, and then negotiate the return of Crimea. That's, that's, that's the visible way of approaching that question. On question of relations between China and Ukraine, normally we experienced good relations with China throughout last two decades. Uh, you may call it partnership, good partnership. Uh, and uh, as we understand, this partnership is still on. One peculiar thing which Ukraine and China had always been very clear on politically was the principle of territorial integrity. Of course, I will not dwell upon why it was important for China. I may argue that it is clear why it was important always for Ukraine. It basically coincides fully with point one of Mr. Abe's approach to uh, Ukrainian situation to which uh, Professor Brown referred. No absolute, I mean, it's a principal position of uh, uh, no, 
never accepting any attempt to change the status quo and, and, and territorial engagement with force. That's basic principle, that's the rule. I mean, it's international. If we have the member of the Security Council who thinks otherwise, then that's the problem of that member of the Security Council, not others. But in that sense, I think our relations with China had been always quite clear and, 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 uh, and normal. Uh, on uh, arms uh, sales, Ukraine for years had been a part of uh, the top ten in the in the world list of uh, uh, countries uh, active in in selling armaments and weapons. China was also one of the destinations of of, uh, of Ukrainian sales. I think as of today, as of today, with the situation Ukraine is now in, uh, this policy uh, will definitely uh, be given a thorough consideration because one of the other main recipients of Ukrainian arms exports was Russia. You may understand the situation we are facing today. To the best of my knowledge, in the course of the last several weeks, these exports from Ukraine to Russia had been cut dramatically, if not to zero level. But the whole sphere is under thorough consideration. Excuse us for new president for being in office only, I think, for five days. And according to our renewed constitution, he is the main responsible actor for this sphere. So definitely, it will be given a new scrutiny, Ukraine's policy in this field. Thank you. Dr. Hirose? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I agree with the ambassador. So um, the Ukraine uh, was uh, uh, Crimea or was, is, uh, and will be a uh, territory of uh, Ukraine. Uh, however, the situation is not easy uh, to think about uh, um, situation and other uh, and recognized states such as Abkhazia and South Ossetia and so on, uh, all of them are, uh, are not uh, be um, desired still now. Uh, so um, I think um, Ukraine should uh, uh, negotiate uh, with uh, Russia, but uh, the process is uh, really difficult. And uh, a second question is uh, Ch China's factor. Uh, uh, Ch China uh, has been uh, make a, a good relationship with Ukraine. For for example, um, they um, they buy uh, many uh, company in Ukraine and uh, uh, some kind of uh, military fleet and so on. Um, but um, in this case. Um, uh, China cannot um, agree with Russian action because uh, China has also uh, national problems such as uh, Tibet and uh, Uyghur and so on. And that's why uh, Russia tried to uh, not make clear the position uh, for the Russian uh, action for Crimea. So, but um, for China, uh, Ukraine is also important partner. So. Maybe it's try to uh, make a good relationship, uh, not only Russia, but also Ukraine uh, uh, in the future. Thank you so much. OK, uh, there was no Japan angle there. Uh, we'll start with you. And then after that, I think Elaine. Hello. Hi, my name is Sophie Jackman. I'm from Kyoto News, and I have a question uh, for Mr. Ambassador. What, so you heard Dr. Brown's talk and his observation that Japan's response to the Ukraine crisis is one of obligation. Some people might say it's a little toothless. What, would, what do you think about that observation, and why do you think Japan is responding in this way? From a Ukrainian perspective, ideally, what would you like Japan to do that it's not doing now? Uh, and what you would uh, appeal to Abisang if he was sitting in the room right now? Thank you very much. 
Thank you for your question. To be brief, I will use this opportunity to say thank you to the Japanese government and to uh, Prime Minister Abe cabinet for its attitude Japan has taken from the very inception of what is called now Ukrainian crisis. I won't agree with the definition that uh, the response was toothless. On the contrary, it's not a secret that we are distant geographically. But on the other hand, we are neighbors because we have only one country in between us. And that is the country in trouble, practically, both for us and for Japan, as we understand. We didn't have territorial problems with Russia. We thought we didn't have because we had all documents, all statutes, all agreements, all whatever. Then suddenly we had. Japan had bigger experience. It had territorial problem with Russia since the war. I remember being a student learning about that Kuril Islands and about San Francisco and about everything. Still we are there. We know that Japan tradition is, I mean, compared to European is a bit slower, I mean, historically. Russia is not also very fast. I mean, sometimes it is fast. With the Ukraine, it was fast. I mean, Sochi Olympics, then Crimea. Simple. Now, what Japan has already done, I think it associated itself firmly with what we consider to be a very important mechanism today, with the fact that the United Nations Security Council is impotent. We must admit that. And it doesn't serve the case of supporting world security and stability. Japan was on a consecutive basis, most recently in Brussels, a part of the so-called G7 effort and G7 response to Ukrainian crisis. I think it's a new development in world politics we see the group of industrialized nations whose main, I mean, historically, the main idea of this G7 club was to, to, to think about global issues and, and economics, whatever. Now, because of one former G7 plus one member, we have a huge political and security crisis. What we face, international community tried several times to put that at the agenda of the United Nations Security Council, legally the main body after the Second World War to cope with these issues. Security Council failed. One of the representatives in the Security Council put it bluntly in the open air, Russia vetoed the United Nations Charter. Now, what response the world has now? G7 had been, I think, the most appropriate forum to give that response. And Japan has been a part of that since the very inception. On the other track, Japan has constantly put prior attention to supporting Ukraine's government in its reform, both through international financial institutions and bilateral. And if you count the national input financially, I think Japan would be top of the list. I mean, compared to, 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 to national uh, assistance to Ukrainian government. We are grateful for that. What more? I mean, it would be Rude for me to ask for more. Just keep on. Keep on. I think uh, if you ask my opinion, Japanese government is on the right track. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elaine Kurtenbach, Associated Press. Um, stepping uh, a bit more toward the economic side of things, energy plays a big role in this crisis, I think. 
And I would be interested to hear from both the ambassador and from Mr. Brown how they view the situation with Russia turning more and more to Asia, China, and also perhaps Korea and Japan to help sort of relieve some of the pressure that the energy problem on its eastern border might be presenting to them as they deal with this crisis. So. Now you start. All right. <laughs> yeah, so on the, the topic of energy, that the way it was sometimes presented was that because of these difficulties that Russia has in its relations with Europe at the moment, that the gas deal with China was somehow an alternative to that, that Russia was going to be selling gas that would have gone to Europe and that was now going to go to China. That's obviously not the case. It's not the same gas. The, the gas which is going to be going to China is based upon development of new resources. That Russia remains tied into a relationship with the European Union that is not going to change anytime soon. And in fact, I think you can see that from Russia's actions that it knows that to be the case. That it's very keen to build the South Stream pipeline, something which Brussels is now uh, seems very kind of skeptical about. And it's also being perhaps, well, more accommodating than it has been in the past to do with gas negotiations with Ukraine. That the deadline has been extended on a couple of occasions, and it seems that the Russian side really don't want to cut off the gas. So I, I don't see them as alternatives. Uh, just to add, I, I think I would agree with the general assessment by uh, Dr. Brown. Uh, one thing, Ukraine has experience of waging energy wars with Russia since 1992. I mean, that was their uh, usual favorite type of weapon. Now they're using others, but gas had always been a weapon. And Gazprom is a main weapon of Russia. I mean, everybody knows that in Europe. In the year 2008, Russians went as far as cutting for a week supplies for Europe. That was a big deal. But that played for easing the situation today. Back in 2008, Europe became a witness that yes, they can do this, they can cut it. So since 2008, Europe started to prepare itself. What we have now, yes, we have negotiations and, uh, and they are still on. And uh, they're about the price. And they're not only about the price, but the whole package deal. Now, the difference between negotiations we had earlier on gas with those we are having today is that EU is participating also, which gives some hope. Anyway, we have experience in this sphere with Russians. And uh, lucky seasonal factor is that we do not have winter coming. So we have time. And we have some light at the end of the tunnel, I think. It's, it's pretty early to disclose. Absolutely right was Professor Brown in saying that that, uh, that, uh, that uh, highly publicized uh, gas deal with, with uh, China has nothing to do with European energy problems because it is, I would rather argue it's mainly political. Substantially, economically, it has nothing to do with uh, gas supplies from, from, uh, from Russia to Europe. On the uh, side pipeline, the so-called Southern Stream, uh, several days ago it had been halted. And uh, we heard both from Bulgaria and Serbia, the two main uh, transit countries for that theoretical new new pipeline that uh, uh, the project had been halted, suspended for indefinite future. So the situation is different from what we had back in 2008, and let's see what happens next. Uh, what I may say, Ukraine and Europe are better prepared today. Thank you. Yes, I see a hand back here. Uh, 
Good afternoon. My name is Andrei Dmitrichenko. I'm a consul of the Russian embassy here in Tokyo. Um, uh, I, uh, it's always uh, very interesting to listen to the questions uh, because they are uh, concentrated on Russia mostly, but uh, the crisis is in Ukraine and uh, the solution is in Ukraine and no one asks uh, what's going on in Ukraine. So I would like to uh, try to fill the gap and to ask uh, three questions uh, to Your Excellency. And then uh, a couple of more to, to the panelists. Uh, just uh, one question, Your Excellency, how can you explain that uh, in February, when there was election, uh, when there was a referendum in uh, Crimea, that 86 percent of population of Crimea waving Russian flags participated in, in, in this referendum, and 93 percent of population uh, decided to quit Ukraine and join Russia. Uh, the figures tell, uh, t t tell the story. Uh, the second thing is uh, we all know that uh, there were terrible, really terrible crimes in Ukraine recently. Uh, we all know the situation when, with snipers, uh, how the crisis started when the snipers started shooting uh, um, uh, police and uh, protesters uh, as well. But uh, recently there was a terrible crime in Ukraine, uh, in Odessa. Uh, when uh, more than 50 people were burned alive. Uh, so can you please uh, tell us what is, uh, h how the investigation goes on? What, wh what is uh, with those nationalists who burned uh, people uh, inside the building, burned alive? And the third question is about uh, uh, strategy to resolve the problem in the southern and eastern parts of Ukraine. Uh, I mean, uh, the anti-terrorist uh, operation still goes on, but uh, those who understand uh, what uh, Ukraine is, what, what Donetsk and Lugansk is. Donetsk is a city of one million people, even more. Just imagine there is an army operation against uh, Kawasaki, for example, with uh, f jet fighters pounding in Kawasaki, with tanks, etc., etc. Uh, you, you can call it an uh, anti-terrorist operation, but uh, it's one million people uh, who are not allowed to leave. So the, 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 these are questions to uh, Your Excellency. And uh, two more questions to panelists. One is uh, about energy. Uh, everyone is, says that Russia is uh, cutting gas, etc., etc. But uh, look at the situation uh, the other way around. Uh, we deliver gas to 16 countries in Europe. It is a huge profit for Russian budget. What is the logic to cut uh, the gas? Even last time when we had to do that, it was because Ukraine siphoned gas. We had to resolve it. Uh, e e even when we said we, we are ready to, to send gas to Europe, we, uh, Ukraine w w w was not allowing to, uh, for it to pass. Uh, and the second question is about uh, uh, it is a very often compared situation around Senkaku, for example, and around uh, Crimea. Uh, I don't see the reasons to compare situations. Do uh, people here in Japan, are, are you afraid that uh, population of Senkaku, uh, you know what I mean, will vote to rejoin China? Uh, in Ukraine, uh, in Crimea, there are two million people. Uh, what, what is the population of Sankaku? So, uh, just I would like to ask you, why, why do you uh, always compare these two things? Thank you very much. Okay. Well, um, generally speaking, uh, we only allow one question per speaker. Uh, but uh, I thought uh, that this was of extraordinary interest, so uh, I allowed him to to ask five. Um, First, the ambassador, uh, can you answer his first three questions? Yeah, course, and then I would like course, to uh, have the second two to the, uh, the other two panelists. I mean, you have good reason for allowing five questions because Russia is the only country in the title of the panel. So it's, it's, it's a good excuse. I mean, we don't have any Russian here, so. <laughs> now first, on referendum. First and foremost, there was no referendum in Crimea in March, no legal referendum. What was called a referendum is a dramatic mockery of democracy. That was exactly the case which happened back in 40s in the Baltic republics under Uncle Joe Stalin, which was called referendum. Tell me please, where the document of the Human Rights Watch of the Russian president giving the exact figures of how many people came to polling stations in Crimea that date. Correct figures, 
30% only of total population, publicized by Russia. It was on the site only for one hour. Then it was taken back. Point is, Crimea was, is, and will be Ukrainian, and make no mistake about it. Question is only when and on which conditions Crimea will be returned to Ukraine. That is a matter of negotiation. Question number two. On snipers in Maidan, three of them are already in prison, in custody. Investigation is still going on. But I, I'm not a judge, I'm not an investigator, but what I read from media covering that issue, because that issue is of big interest for Ukraine. For the first time since independence, Ukraine had casualties. Ukrainian citizens were killed in the center of our capital. A week before that, a group of Russian Secret Service agents appeared in Kiev. We know their names. Investigation is still going on. Now, on question number three, about whatever it is, Donetsk, Kawasaki. Investigation in Odessa, on Odessa affair is going on. The biggest team of investigators, comprising up to 50 people, top specialists, are working. Be sure that we have much bigger interest in knowing the truth. I won't go much into detail on that. Let's wait for the conclusions. Question number three. Bombing Donetsk and tank on Donetsk, my advice to you, don't watch Russian TV, please. Then you won't be referring to Kawasaki being gunned and bombed by tanks and, and jets. What Russia has been telling recently about Ukraine through its TV consists of 50% open lie, 40% manipulation, and 10% zombie on population. <laughs> Dr. Goebbels is having a good run for his money there. Now, one issue on, uh, on uh, uh, the 2008 gas affair with, with, uh, with uh, Ukraine siphoning the gas. If you wish, I want, I may, in detail, explain what happened in 2008 about the so-called siphoning. Back in 2008, the grand design of cutting the gas supplies to Europe in winter was to cut eastern regions of Ukraine where heavy industries depend mainly on gas to create incredible, I mean, terrible conditions for those population because how it happens, Russian gas flows to Ukraine and is mainly consumed in the eastern part because what is going on to Europe is taken from the storages in the west of Ukraine. It's a compensatory techniques. And when the whole gas pipeline system was developed back in the 60s, that was a big design of the then Soviet Union to make Europe dependent on gas from Russia, from the Soviet Union at the time. So the biggest depots of gas were created in the west part of Ukraine. Huge, the biggest in Europe. So gas for Europe goes from there. It's pumped out and sent to Europe. What Russian engineers didn't know at that time, that that gas from depots in the western part can be reversed back. It was not designed. It was the genius of Ukrainian engineers back in 2008 that in three days they found the formula to pump that back from the depots and send it to the eastern part of Ukraine. Europe suffered, yes, some countries, including Bulgaria and some Central European countries. They had shortages. But the main target, the population of eastern Ukraine, the so-called Russian-speaking, 
another, another hello to Dr. Goebbels. The Russian-speaking population of eastern Ukraine did not suffer at that time because of the reverse of gas from that big gas depots in western Ukraine. Today, one of the variants of cutting the dependency of Ukraine and Europe from energy supplies from Russia in gas also include the development of the reverse mode of piping gas from Europe to Ukraine. Because sometimes we face a situation when it is, look at this, it is cheaper for Ukraine to buy Russian gas sent to Europe from European customers. That's a part of the economy we are living in, having this neighbor of ours. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Hirose, uh, would you like to jump in on some of those latter two questions? Okay, um, thank you for your question. Um, about the referendum, um, I also, uh, I, I, I didn't think that it was real refer referendum um, because um, the result of the referendum uh, announced that uh, the vote for yes was 96.77%, uh, uh, but uh, the, about 10 percent of the Crimean uh, uh, people were uh, Crimean Tatars, and uh, um, about 30 percent of Crimean people were uh, 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 Ukrainian people. Uh, so both of them are not want to uh, uh, vote yes, so uh, they, they boycotted the uh, referendum. So the referendum uh, cannot be uh, legal. And in addition, uh, in Sebastopol, a uh, special city, uh, at the, uh, there, there were the about uh, more than 120% uh, uh, of the uh, peop, uh, uh, of the people of the uh, Sebastopol uh, special uh, city. So it is really strange um, boat. So. Um, I, I, I didn't think I, I don't think that uh, it was a, a legal referendum, and about the uh, uh, tape uh, snipers and uh, Euromaidan, uh, there are so many information about the uh, uh, snipers. So um, I don't want to uh, say about uh, my uh, opinion about it. So uh, I hope uh, the Ukrainian government uh, will find a, a real uh, result about it. Uh, about Odessa, um, I had that uh, some people uh, were coming from um, uh, uh, Transdunyasto and uh, agitated to the uh, Odessa. If so, uh, Ukrainian people were really uh, victims. So I hope uh, it also uh, will be uh, investigated by the Ukrainian government. And, and third, um, and the strategy uh, for the uh, resolution of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, it is also a very uh, difficult problem, but um, I, I hope uh, the uh, new uh, Ukrainian government uh, uh, try to uh, uh, make the uh, peaceful resolution uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Dr. Brown. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are other questions, so I'll keep it brief. But on the, the energy issue, I wouldn't speak about 2006 or 2008, 9, but with the present situation, I, I wouldn't disagree. I think that Russia has made it very clear that it doesn't want to cut off the supplies because it knows that it will be blamed by countries within the EU of being up to its usual tricks that uh, because the kind of context is, um, you know, a, a lot of sort of anti-Russian feelings. So I, I'm quite clear on the fact that Russia doesn't want to. It has seemingly made clear that it would settle for a lower gas price. I think it was around $385 per thousand cubic meters, which would be a $100 reduction from what it was initially uh, asking for. But that hasn't been accepted by the Ukrainian side. Still, gas supplies haven't been cut off. 
negotiations are continuing. So I, I, I don't disagree. The reverse flow thing, though, is interesting. That the Russian side has said that if there were to be reverse flows from EU countries back into Ukraine, that would break the treaty agreements and that would be a big problem. Quickly on the Senkaku then, I don't really see there being a, a connection that I only raised that because Abe made that statement. I don't think Abe really thinks there's a connection. It's just an opportunity to, to raise that issue, bring the Senkaku subject back into people's minds. Well, I'm sure that uh, if I was the Russian diplomat, I would want to be responding to some of their answers. But unfortunately, this isn't a debate. It's a question situation. Well, if, if you may, uh, what I would recommend is in the future, why don't we have something more like a debate style? And that would, I think that would, there would be interest in that among many people. Uh, yeah, please. But you listen to my initial statement, gentlemen. I refer to what President Poroshenko offered at the outset, at the most important point, his view. And you ask again about the strategy. Shall I repeat it? Terrorists should lay down their arms first. Security corridor for Russian mercenaries will be established to withdraw them to Russia. Third, local elections should be held to find the representative local administration to talk to. Because Kiev had always been open to talk to. Easy. And your ambassador is participating in Kiev in these negotiations. And I'm repeating this for the third time. The strategy is there, and it is supported by international community, including, as we understand, we didn't hear to the contrary, from the aggressive side, the Russian side. Let's hope. Thank you. OK, there's still time for questions. Yes, please. Thank you very much. My name is David Goginashvili. I'm a PhD student from KU University. I'd love to address my question to Your Excellency. Um, please tell me, what's the difference between Lugansk, Donetsk, and Crimea? You did not fight for Crimea, and you're fighting for Donetsk and Lugansk. Why, don't you, why did not you fight for Crimea? I mean, I have my thoughts about it. I just want to hear your opinion about it. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I responded to that question lots of times already in the last several weeks. And that's a big question still in Ukraine. Now, imagine the situation. 22nd February. Former President flees away from the country. The government had been ousted earlier, and they were all acting, those ministers. Now, on the 23rd of February, the parliament, the only remaining legal body of power in Ukraine, assembles and takes a decision that president has fled. It cannot anymore continue with his responsibilities. So the interim president is appointed by constitutional majority. And the debate to form a new government has started. It takes a couple of days. By the 27th of February, the government is in place. It is voted. Same date, green men started to appear in Crimea. 1st of March, Russian Duma de facto declares war against Ukraine, taking a decision to allow Russian troops to be sent to Ukraine. The government, the new Ukrainian government, was in office for one day. One day. Now listen to that. 
two former defense ministers of Ukraine under Yanukovych regime, two former heads of security service under Yanukovych regime, all top officials of the security sector, guess where they are found now? In Russia. In course of three years, the damage to the security sector of Ukraine, I mean, it should be investigated, it should be investigated. And in the meantime, Russia is mounting their troops, sending, pouring more and more and more Ukrainian military stationed in Crimea are waiting for orders. The order which is coming avoids civilian casualties. At some stage, the order which has been communicated also to Russians would be, in the event of open attack, we will fire back. Official version of why didn't we fought back at that time in Crimea is still this, avoiding civilian casualties. Avoiding civilian casualties. And it so happened that during the Crimean crisis, I think we had only one casualty on the Ukrainian side. And uh, I don't know whether there were any casualties on, 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 on the Russian side, on, on, on Russian troops. So because of that, of that tense situation. And uh, in the East Ukraine, I mean, it went to open hostilities. We, we know this. And they are still, still going on. They are still going on. What is striking, Russian media do not report about those casualties of Russian citizens. Russian citizens dying in Ukraine. You won't find information on Russian media about people who were sent for whatever cause, helping Russian speakers or whatever, and who are now sent back, like corpses, back to Russia. No. Yesterday, a very interesting publication appeared in Nova Gazeta in Russian source stating that retired Russian military servicemen in Rostov region were asked by military commissariats to come back in recent weeks. And one of them wanted to talk about that. Military commissariats were offering special, well, special mission, well paid. Today, the news came that those retired Afghan veteran is already in custody. That's what we are facing now. Apart from the land war which Russia is waging on Ukrainian territory through mercenaries, it is waging huge informational war, huge propagandistic war, amazing, on an unprecedented scale. In that sense, of course we wish for peace. We are a peaceful nation, of course. But question why Ukraine didn't start fighting back in Crimea is still, I think, in the political context of current Ukraine, because some argue that Ukraine had enough, up to 25, 30,000 troops, who could fight back. Crimea was saved from civilian casualties, let me, let me put it this way. East Ukraine was not. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dr. Hirose, do you want to add any of your analysis on why uh, Ukraine chose not to fight at the time of the Crimea referendum? Um, is it military? Well, just, yeah, I, I think his question is, 
why did, at that <coughs> earlier stage, did Ukraine decide not to fight? Um, Militarily, yes. Um, and it, it is my guess, but um, I think um, now uh, Ukraine situation is really com uh, confusing. So um, Ukraine think that maybe the first thing is uh, recovering the uh, stability as a whole Ukraine, then um, maybe uh, they must uh, uh, catch up, uh, recover the uh, Crimea. So this is a, some order, I think. So you think at, at that time too, the main concern was the stability of the broader yeah. Ukraine? Yeah. All right, uh, we do have time for one more short question. So anybody who has a burning final point on your mind, this is your last chance. Well, we see Siegfried does, but anybody else who hasn't asked a question yet? Siegfried it is. Uh, once more, a question more about the uh, future. Um, the president said he wants Ukraine to be a member of the EU. Do you think it, it's a realistic um, thinking now? I think uh, your, the EU has a lot of problems with their own countries. And uh, I think the, now a, a new member Ukraine, I think it will increase the problem. And I think perhaps the EU thinks uh, it, the Russian will not happy with Ukrainian to be a member of the EU. And I think the EU perhaps may be more divided members, members uh, of if uh, Ukraine should be a member or not. What, what do you think what will happen? All right, well, I want to go, we have a very short time left, so I'd like to go actually down the line, starting with Dr. Hirose, then the ambassador, and then Dr. Brown. Uh, if you want to just say yes or no, that's fine. But do you see EU membership in the future of Ukraine? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, the EU membership for Ukraine is, uh, seems to be really difficult in, in this situation because um, as I said, um, some EU officials uh, regret that uh, they forced uh, Ukraine to choose a uh, pro-Russia or a pro-Western. In addition, um, some people say that uh, Ukraine cannot be without uh, Russia. So some people are recommended that uh, Ukraine should be a neutral state uh, like a Finland. Uh, so, um, in addition, EU situation also very difficult now, uh, especially economically. So that's why uh, in the future, uh, EU membership for Ukraine is really difficult, I think. Well, the answer would be short. Yes, realistic. I would say it's not an immediate future, of course. But vis-a-vis -vis the problems EU is, yes, we know about that problem. But let me assure you, we wish to have these EU problems. <laughs> not, not Russian problems, like, like whatever, whatever problems they may have. Thank you. Okay, do you want to touch this one, Dr. Brown? Yeah, unfortunately, I have to disagree. I think that uh, not. And in, in the, the French foreign minister uh, said as much after the, the uh, G7 meetings. He said that a lot of members are, are not keen on Ukrainian membership at the moment. Ministers okay. come and go, Ukraine and European Union remains. Well, I love to end a press conference on a controversy. That's beautiful. So um, before uh, we let you go, there is one uh, last little uh, point here, and that's that uh, these three people have just earned their one-year honorary membership to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan so that uh, we can continue the debate in the mate bar later, perhaps. Uh, first of all, I have here uh, a one-year honorary, uh, honorary membership for Dr. Ihor Karchenko, the ambassador of Ukraine to Japan. Thank you very much for a stimulating presentation. And 
Dr. Yoko Hirose uh, has also helped us very much to, for, to give us more background and also to give us uh, an academic perspective to balance against the ambassadors. And bringing it all home to Japan was this man here, Dr. James Brown. Thank you very much for contextualizing it to our local audience. Well, the event is finished, but for those of you who are journalists and those of you who think you might be writing about this story in the future, I'm happy to say that the three panelists will stay here a couple of minutes to exchange meishis so that you can have their contacts and uh, have future questions on your own time. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.